Good morning. How we doing today, church? Everybody good? Amen, amen. Uh, if I was a little bit honest, though, this morning, I'm a little bit tired. Anybody else tired this morning? I might take a nap up here in a little bit. If you see me pass out, you'll know it's the women's fault. i um, just going to go ahead and let you know that. Women kept me up all last night partying. Um, let me rephrase that. That didn't sound as good as it did in my mind. Um, we had the women's event last night. And we were up praising Jesus, Amen. right? Amen. Ladies, it was good. Amen. Amen. Brandy did a phenomenal job. Everybody, everybody did an incredible job. And, um, and if you weren't there, you missed it. Guys, sorry. I'm sorry you couldn't come. Only I could be there. Uh, but this is our fifth week of this series called um, My Big Fat Mouth. And this is our final week of this series. And I know y'all wondering, y'all looking at me all weird. The band's still up here. You'll see in a minute why they're still up here. Um, but we've been in this series, and the, the main kind of uh, goal, the overarching theme of this series has been this. My words hold tremendous what? Power. My words are powerful. Our words are powerful. Why are they so powerful? They're powerful because they're not empty. There's more behind it. It comes from our what? From our hearts, from the overflow of our hearts. Luke 6, 45. Throw it up real quick. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his. Heart. For the mouth speaks what the is full of. Whatever consistently flows out of our mouths. Now, I know sometimes we're going to mess up, but what consistently comes out of our mouth on a daily basis is an accurate picture of who we really are. Now, that was the first week. The second week, we got a little more specific. What did we talk about the second week? Anybody remember? Complaining. Complaining, right? Not the sermon that nobody needed to hear because none of us have that issue. But we basically, we basically come to this final conclusion here. If you can change your situation... God's given you the means to change it, then change it. But if you can't change your situation, change your what? Your perspective. If you can't change what's going on in your life, uh, then we've got to change uh, the, 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 the way we view our current situation. In other words, start looking for the ways that God is moving in your life, the way he's moving in the junk and in the mess. Because sometimes God uses those situations or in those situations to change us. And then sometimes he uses our current situation to change the people around us. Amen? So here's, here's the third week. Anyone remember what we talked about? Y'all didn't get this last week. Anybody remember what we talked about the third week? Yes. That's good. Criticism versus encouragement. Do you want to be a demolisher or do you want to be a builder? We read from James chapter 3, and we stayed in that story where we're given all these illustrations of how, how mighty our tongue is. It's such a small part, but how influential it is in the rest of our life. It leads our life. He says our tongues are like fire. They're like pilot lights. When we're born, they're lit. And we can either go and we can spread a forest fire of love and, and compassion and hope and forgiveness around everyone that we come in contact with, or we can ignite a fire the opposite, right? We can offer hate and negativity and vengeance and resentment and all of those things. And then we end up just leaving our families and the people in our life scorched. Last week, does anybody remember the ones that was able to make it out in the storm? Do you remember what we talked about last week? Lying. lying. See, for many of us, I believe lying has become a necessary normal in our life. It's just true. It's become necessary. We, we don't even realize we're doing it half of the time. In today's culture, it's just part of life. It's no big deal. You know, a little lie here, a little lie there sprinkled in. But the problem is is those lies can finally overtake us to the point of de deceiving ourselves, deceiving who we are to the point of almost living a lie. And this is where the enemy wants to keep us. This is, he wants us to live in deception. He wants us to be where deception becomes our truth and our reality. Scripture says this. Scripture says that lies and deceptions is, is Satan's native what? It's his language. It's his native tongue. He is the father of all lies. He is the great deceiver, which adversely means that Jesus is the way, the... He's truth. So if the enemy can keep us from the truth, and when I say truth, I mean from truth of, of who we are, 
who we are in Christ, if he can deceive that, or he can keep us from the, the truth of Jesus and his word, then he can keep us in bondage. So are you guys ready to jump in this week? Let's pray before we jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for the opportunity to be here in your house this morning. We pray, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts, that you will mold us and shape us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, this entire series, I tried my best to keep our focus on whose big fat mouth? Ours, on my big fat mouth, and the power in which our words have. And I know for some of you that's been extremely difficult. Come on. It has. It's been difficult for some of us because you sit here week after week and you're saying, well, I sure wish so-and-so was here. I wish my boss was here. Man, if my husband would have been here the week that he talked about criticism, or my teenager, if my teenager would have just been here the week that he talked about complaining, come on, moms and dads. And I know it's been tempting from time to time maybe to use the elbow, you know, beside of you and say, listen up, did you hear what the pastor said? If you don't, don't worry, I'll text it to you later. <laughs> so I mean, come on now, it's real. I'll remind you every single day for the rest of your life what the pastor said this Sunday. Be honest today, who here has been tempted to do that throughout the series? You've been just a little bit tempted to think of someone else that needed to hear it. I get it, and this is why I get it. The reason that you feel that way is because you've been on the receiving end, just like I have, of the trash talk. You've been on the other side of it. Yes, you've said some yourself, but you've been on the other end. You've been on the receiving end of criticism and discouragement. You've been hurt by friends, and you've been hurt by coworkers and bosses. You've been hurt by your wife, by your husband, by your parents maybe, by your kids. People at school, your extended family, your church family, we hurt each other sometimes, maybe even hurt by your own pastor. All of us, at some point, words that have been spoken, spoken to us, about us, or over us have affected our lives negatively. Amen? It's true. And for some of us, though, what I realized, for some of us, that's all we've ever known. For some of us, we grew up in a home where mom and dad never said a positive word. Where mom and dad were always negative. Mom and dad was never encouraging. And you grew up thinking, man, I'll never amount to anything. You, you felt like a complete failure in everything you did. You felt like you were a screw-up. You felt like you couldn't measure up. You could never measure up at home. You couldn't measure up at school. You couldn't measure up at work. Maybe somebody in here, your, very, your first marriage, man, it, it turned into a disaster. Or maybe your marriage now, you, you, you're belittled constantly, talking down to constantly. You're, you're slandered all the time in your marriage. Uh, I told you, you can't do anything right, and that's all you ever hear. You're never praised, you're never thanked, and you're never honored. And you've chewed on that. And you've been chewed on and you've been spit out so much that it makes you feel almost inhuman. And what happens to us is we, what it brings us to is a place of doubt in our value. Am I really valued? It makes us even question our purpose in life. Do I really have a purpose? It even questions, makes us question sometimes our existence. Have you ever had that question? Am I really who they say I am? They keep telling me I'm good for nothing, then maybe I'm good for nothing. Are the words that spoken to me and about me, are they the sum total of who I am? So we talked last week about how the enemy's mission, the enemy's mission is to completely deceive us. Deceive us of our own standing with God, deceive us of where we are with God, and deceive us of the truth of God's word. Because if he can use other people in our lives to get all up in our heads and, and make us think differently about ourselves, if he can use people in our life to tear us down, to devalue us, then do you know it makes his job a lot easier? God's Word says this in 2 Corinthians. I want you to see this. I've taught on this before, but I want you to see it this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. It says, We demolish... In other words, we, we reject arguments. Now, when you think about arguments, it could be any arguments that set itself up against God's word. But I want you to think of it this way this morning. Every lie, every slander, every sarcastic comment in your life, 
We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And what do we do? We take what? We take prisoner every thought to make it, to make it obedient to Christ and His Word. We take ca captive every harsh word, every sarcastic comment, every lie, every hurtful expression, every damaging slander, and we make it obedient to Christ. Here's where I'm going. It's not who they say I am, but it's who God says I am through Christ Jesus. And I know this is a little strange for the ones that's never been here. Maybe this is your first time to have these guys up here. We don't usually do this in the middle but I couldn't think of a better way for us to express it out loud and for us to express it to each other than to sing this song, Who You Say I Am. I want everybody to stand. We're going to worship this morning. of God himself do you believe that you are the heirs with Christ that you have a purpose that you are a child of the one true king 
Because if you believe that, I want to see you with your hands raised high as they sing this one more time. I am chosen. I am a child of the King. Let's sing. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen. can be seated. That felt pretty good, didn't it? Man, we need to sing more in the middle of the sermons, don't we? Yeah, that's a good idea. It's a good idea. Gosh, he's getting back up to preach. Yes, I am. <laughs> we need to remind ourselves, I believe. We need to remind ourselves every day through our own lips, through our own admission, who God says we are. Not what everybody else or who everybody else says that we are, but we need to remind ourselves what God says about us. We need to take those things that come into our, our minds, and we need to reject those things that are against God's word and replace them with truth. Now, let me give you some examples. Are you ready of what I mean rejecting and replacing? Here's one. I never felt loved growing up. Yeah, it's one of those moments I never felt loved. My parents didn't love me. Nobody loved me growing up. Let me replace that with the truth. We are all, every single one of us, Christian or not, believer or not, we are loved unconditionally. Romans 8.38 says this, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers. Do you hear this? Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from what? From the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every one of us in this room is loved unconditionally. How about this one? You're going to think this one's trivial. If you've been through this, though, you won't think it's trivial. I'm ugly. I've always been said, I'm told I'm, I'm ugly. I don't feel like I, I have a purpose. I feel like I'm worthless. I've always been told that I am worthless. Let's replace that with the truth. You are God's masterpiece. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, For we are all God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. We are all God's masterpiece. We are his workmanship. Here's another one. I felt all my life, I'm all alone. I don't have anybody to care for me. I don't have anybody to walk with me through all the trials of life and all the troubles. This is what God says. God says, you are never alone. I am always with you. Deuteronomy 31.6 says this, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor what? nor forsake you. Our God is always with us, no matter what we go through or what we deal with. Here's another one, another lie. I'll never measure up. I'm too weak. I'll never measure up. I'm a big screw up, and that's all I do is screw up. Well, let me tell you something. That's a lie too. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says this, for I can do everything. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Here's another one. This one's huge. You ready? You'll never be forgiven. 
I will not forgive you for what you did. You will never, ever, ever be forgiven. And I'm going to tell you something. Through Christ Jesus, you are already forgiven. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. You don't have to carry on the baggage. You have been forgiven. Now here's the fact. All of us have experienced hurtful words in our life. True? True? that have shaped our lives into the people that we are. And for some reason, I don't get it, but as human beings, for some reason, the things that impact us the most are the negative and the critical things said about us. And they start to sow things in us like this. Doubt, fear, insecurity, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, lack of trust. And God doesn't want any of his children to ever live life that way. He wants us to live in freedom. And so there's two things that we're going to talk about. Two things very quickly that we're going to talk about that we must do when we're carrying around the weight of words that have been spoken to us, over us, and about us. Because here's the fact. If we don't do something about this weight that we're carrying, if we can't do something about it, this is what's going to happen. It's going to continue throughout every generation. If we don't end the cycle, this is what we're going to see, and you've seen it too. Here it is. Hurt people end up hurting people. Broken people break people. Abandoned people end up abandoning people. Slandered people end up slandering people. And the list could go on and on and on. But for us to allow the chains to fall off and these burdens to fall, to break the cycle, there's two things that we must do. And I'll go ahead and give you this warning. One of those things cannot stand alone. They both have to happen because neglecting the one will end up choking out the other. And you'll say amen about this. We've already talked about the first one. Because y'all thinking this is going to be too long. No, it ain't. We already talked about the first one. first one's this. We've got to believe who God says I am. No matter what, we have to believe what God's word says about us. We have to believe in the midst of the louder voices. You can say amen about this. In the louder voices, always the ones that's negative and critical. They're the ones that's always blaring in our ears. But regardless of that, we have to believe, even in the midst of the voices outside and inside our head, that I am who God says that I am. We're fixing to take a turn in this sermon because the second one is a lot tougher for us to do. And it's this one. We've got to be who God says I am. We've got to be who God says I am. It doesn't matter how much we believe who God says that we are. If you're still going to allow the weight of someone's words or actions in your past to guide you in your future. We must first believe who God says that we are. But then we've got to become who God says that we are. Where are you going with this, Caleb? Let me give you some examples. Loved people. When you know you're loved by an almighty God, loved people love people. Those that have been shown mercy, give mercy. Those who have been shown grace, they extend grace throughout their life. Those who receive much, give much. This one's going to hurt a little bit. Those who are forgiven, what? They forgive. Those who have experienced God's grace and has been forgiven, they walk in forgiveness. They show others forgiveness. I want us to look at probably the most exciting verse in the Bible. Y'all going to love this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. It says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Amen. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, we could go all kinds of different directions, and I could beat you down with that, and we could go, go that direction, but we're not going to do that this morning. Let God speak to you how God wants to speak to you in that verse. But, but here's the thing that I want you to notice. Forgiven people forgive people, period. Forgiven people forgive people. 
It doesn't matter how much you believe that you've been forgiven. It doesn't matter how much you believe that what God says that you are or who God says you are. Those words and those actions in your past will continue to haunt you, continue to do damage to every relationship in your life. It will affect your marriage, your kid's life, your happiness, your joy, your fulfillment until you not only believe, but you become what God says that you are. You will not only, you, you're not only believe that you have been forgiven, but you give forgiveness. Now, here's what I realized this morning. Some of you, you've been through some really tough circumstances in life. I mean, growing up, now you might be going through some tough circumstances. And honestly, forgiveness doesn't even seem feasible to you. It's like, forget about it. I can't, I can't forgive I have no desire, absolutely no desire to forgive them for the pain that they've caused me. Here's what I want to say to you. If we ever wait on the desire or the want to forgive when somebody really hurts us, we're never going to do it. Forgiveness is not an emotion. It is a decision. It is a choice that you stamp down. I forgive. But Caleb, they don't deserve my forgiveness. You don't understand. They don't deserve it. Truth be known, amen, you're probably 100% right. They don't deserve it. Caleb, I can't let them off the hook, but I've got a question for you. You may not be able to let them off the hook, but can you let yourself off the hook? Because forgiveness is not so much about letting them off the hook, as it's about letting yourself off the hook and giving yourself freedom. Because true forgiveness frees you from the weight that you've been carrying. It frees you from carrying around the pain and the hurt that those words and those actions have caused you. And for some of you, you are carrying a tremendous weight. Forgiveness allows you, listen, to quit letting what they did or what they said define you and starts giving you the freedom to be who God said you are. And as long as you harbor unforgiveness in your heart, you will never, listen to me, you will never be set free from who they say you are because you will always be labeled by that. Forgiveness, and this is tough. Forgiveness is giving someone in your past something they don't deserve. Do you know that? Forgiveness is giving something that they don't deserve, but why would we do it so that you can give the people in your present right now what they do deserve? Because here's the thing, our pinned up unforgiveness, it is hurting the people in our present just like the person hurt us in our past. And here's, here's what I think the problem comes in with forgiveness. I think we're confused about it. I don't think we quite understand it. So I hope that we'll have some clarity in just a few minutes. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let's look at it. Ephesians 4, 31. It says, get rid of all bitterness. Rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, every form of hatred. Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Go back to that first verse, 31. I want you to say the first two words with me. Can you do it? Do it right now. First two words. Say that one more time. Get rid it does not say this, stop being bitter. It don't say that, does it? It don't say, let's lay the bitterness down for a little while. It says this, let's get rid of it. And some of us think that for forgiveness, this is what we think about forgiveness. Forgiveness is suppressing and compacting feelings about certain words and actions that hurt us. Trying to make ourselves over time feel different about the situation. Trying to store away the negative feelings so that we can somehow just muddle through life. That's not forgiveness. No, that will never work. Suppressing and compacting feelings only work for a little while. And then what happens? It compacts, it compacts, pressure builds. And what happens? Boom! It explodes. This phrase, get rid, I had to look it up. This phrase, get rid, literally means this, to take away. It means to take it somewhere else and to leave it there. 
Let me see if I can paint a picture. Real forgiveness is like this. It's like taking all the bitterness and all the rage and all the anger and the brawling, you know, the, 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 the brawling back and forth, the slander, the vengeance, the resentment, everything that is attached to that thing in your past that's holding you back. It's taking all of those elements and it's like packing it up in a box, sealing it with tape, putting a shipping label on it and sending it to the other side of the world. That's what forgiveness looks like. It's like telling the person that hurt you everything you own in a box to the left. You must not know about me. I don't even want a, I don't even want a remnant of it. I'm packing it all up, all the bitterness, all the rage, and I'm sending it on its way. But see, some of you, some of you say, but I have forgiven. I have forgiven. I've said it. But why do we keep bringing it up? If we've truly forgiven, why do we keep bringing it up over and over again? We bring it up to our wives. We bring it up to our husbands. We bring it up to our friends. We bring it up to our kids. And y'all, from what I understand from Scripture, that's not true forgiveness because that's not getting rid of. That's not taking it somewhere and leaving it there. That's just compacting it and suppressing it till eventually you blow up. Verse 32, we're going to dig a little bit deeper. Verse 32 says this. It says, forgive as how? As who forgave? As God forgave. Forgive as God forgave. I want you to, I want you to look at this, and I, I've preached on this before, but I, I saw some different elements here. Scripture says this in Lamentations 3.23. Lamentations 3.23. It says, great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Can anybody say amen about that? Does that not mean anything to you? That his mercies, his forgiveness is fresh to us every morning. Guess what? If we forgive as God forgave us, our mercy should be new each and every morning. We shouldn't continue to carry the baggage from day to day to day to day. We shouldn't carry that resentment and that bitterness from day to day. We need to quit this whole, listen, you remember the time when you, two years ago, you remember when, you remember when that happened? The reason things blow up in our life, the reason things get out of hand, y'all, in our relationships is because we refuse to start over fresh and new each day. True forgiveness is starting new every day. How else does God forgive? Psalm 103.12, let's look at it. Psalm 103.12 says this. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Anyone thankful for that? That he removed our sins as far as they can be removed. But here's the thing. If we're supposed to forgive as God forgives... Why do we keep those transgressions so close to us? If we're supposed to forgive as God forgave, it goes back to that getting rid of. It goes back to putting it in a box and shipping it off as far away from us as possible. How else does God forgive? Matthew 18, here's the last one. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter, he came to Jesus. He asked him a question. He said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone? Just one. One person, over and over again, how often should I forgive them who sins against me? And Peter asked, seven times, Lord? I mean, that's pretty good, right? If somebody keeps offending you, seven times sounds pretty good. This is what Jesus says. No, 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 no. Not seven times. Jesus says, but 70 times seven. He's saying, Peter, even if that person continues to hurt you, forgive them 70 times seven. Now, if you know math, you know what that equals out to, right? It equals out to 490, but y'all were missing the point. That wasn't the point. What Jesus is saying here is this, forgiveness must be endless. Forgiveness must be endless. What Jesus is saying, stop keeping count. Stop writing the roll of how many times people have hurt you. It doesn't matter how many times someone has hurt you or how severely you've been hurt. Forgive them. How many times in our relationships, y'all, do we keep count? How many times do we mark down on the pencil? And then, and, then, and then when something goes wrong again, how quickly we throw it back out there. 
And that's the point of getting rid of. That's the point of making mercies new every day. Because you know when we do that, you know what happens? We lose count because every time's the first time. Now I know this morning that this kind of forgiveness humanly is impossible. Do you know that? It's humanly impossible for us to to do this kind of forgiveness. But remember, we're supposed to remember who God says we are, and this is what God says. He says, all things are possible through through Christ who gives me strength. Through Christ, we can choose, we can make a decision to forgive just as God forgave us. I want everybody to stand for a moment. I don't I don't know. This is what's so crazy. Brandy's Brandy's message to some degree last night was just right along these lines about about forgiveness and about getting rid of and letting things go. And I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what's holding you back. I don't know what's keeping you from moving forward in your relationship with Christ and the people around you. But I want you to do something for me. As you contemplate this kind of forgiveness, not our definition of forgiveness, but this kind of definition of forgiveness, I want you to think about what Christ did for you. Oh, that's just a pastor's trick. No, 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 no. I think we need to think about this every day of our life, what Christ did for us. Think about it. He willingly went to the cross. He willingly suffered and died as people watched and gawked at him as this great spectacle made fun of him, the king of the Jews. They made fun of him, and they even divided up his clothes by casting lots. Most of his disciples abandoned him after he was arrested. They tuck tail, and they run. And here's the thing. As he's dying on this cross, and all of this is going on. He looks out to the crowd, and I'm going to tell you something. It's not just the crowd that he sees there in the present. It's also your face that he sees. He sees your face as he's on the cross, and he sees us, and he sees how broken we're going to be. He sees how messy it's going to get. He sees how we're going to walk away from him and make bad choices in our life. But what did he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I know what that person said to you or did to you was wrong. It was wrong, and we can't make it right. It broke you in so many ways, you wouldn't even like to admit it. There's ways that it's broken us, some of these things in our life that we don't even know about. I know it's broken you, but here's what I don't want you to do. Don't let it continue to break you. Don't let it continue to eat at you and break you in your future. Pack up every bit of bitterness, rage, anger, and malice and send it on its way. I asked Gary, I don't always do this, but I said, man, I got a specific song I want you to play at the end. And it's the song, It Is Well. Y'all know that song? Beautiful song. And this is why the chorus goes like this. It says, through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. You know what that says to me? No matter what comes my way, no matter how people label me, no matter what is said, through it all, I will focus on you and who you say that I am. Through it all, through it all, it is well. The bridge goes like this. So let go, my soul, and trust in him. Get rid of it. Let go, my soul. Get rid of the things that's holding you back, all the bitterness and all the pain, and just trust in him. I don't know what you need to let go of this morning. I really don't. I don't know if it's something that your wife did or said. I don't know if it's something that your husband did or said. I don't know if it's something that your parents did to you as you were young or something that your friends said. I don't know what it is, but I believe that God's led me and Brandy down these same wave paths these last two days because there's some people that are still holding on to things that are keeping them held back that they need to let them go this morning. And so as we sing, we're going to pray, and as we sing together, if God's spoken to you, the front is always open, and somebody will be here to pray with you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much again for the opportunity to be in your house to worship the one true king. God, we are so thankful 
that through Christ, we are a child of the one true king. That you love us with uh, uh, abandon. You, you love us recklessly. That you love us unconditionally. We thank you, God, that you are always with us. That you never leave us nor forsake us. So this morning, help us to remember not what the labels have placed on us, not what people have said to us, but God, what your word says about us. But God, not only that, Lord, the area that most of us need to work in, we like to think about the things you say about us, all the good things you say about us, but Lord, where we struggle the most is being the person, being the person that you say we are. And so, God, this morning, speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, that if there's something in us that we need to lay down, and it might not just be forgiveness. Maybe you're loved, but you don't love. Maybe you've found mercy, but you're not merciful. God, whatever it is in our life that we need to get rid of, God, we pray today that you'll give us the boldness and the strength to lay it down and never pick it up again. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we pray that you would continue, continue to help us realize that because of you, we can say that it is well, that we can find joy in any situation because of your spirit that lives in us, God. Thank you for what you've taught us this morning about forgiveness, God. Thank you for the freedom that you give us in that. And thank you for setting that example for us, Father. Father, we love you and we thank you for meeting here with us this morning. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' holy, precious name. Amen.